Dear God, I just thank you for what Peter just said and um, the encouragement I've been getting that just like rain falls and hits the earth and waters the earth, um, and none of us have ever seen rain get sucked back up into the sky. Uh, that's the same for your word, that when your word is proclaimed, it always fulfills your purpose for it. So I just pray that that is what would happen today. Here, Lord, as, as we look at uh, Ephesians, yes, yeah, soften our hearts to hear and to believe and to love you more. And in Jesus' name, amen. So as most of you know, um, I grew up in this church, probably came here around age like 10 or 11, fifth or sixth grade. And so writing this sermon was really interesting because as I'm writing it the last couple of weeks, I'm thinking about who I used to be in this church. Um, so as a kid, as a teenager, for the first couple of years of college, I'm not really following the Lord. Um, so just kind of hitting me as I'm doing this. I'm sitting in these very chairs. I think we used to have pews or something. Um, and I'm thinking about whatever I can so that the sermon goes faster, right? <laughs> like whatever girl I like or sports or whatever, right? Whatever I can do. Um, and now God's brought me to a place where I'm about to preach a two-hour sermon. <laughs> you guys are laughing, but... Um, but but seriously, I, I was thinking about that. And... Um, you know, what changed in me, what changed in me is that during that time I was spiritually dead. I was spiritually dead. And God, through Jesus, made me spiritually alive. Um, that's what changed. And so um, that, that's just what we're going to learn about in our passage today, partly. And I just want to say to all of you as well, if you are a Christian, if you have trusted in Jesus, the same exact thing has happened to you. You were spiritually dead. None of us were born Christians, and Jesus has made you spiritually alive. And so we're looking at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 today. And so um, I'm going to read that in a second, but what we're going to learn today is basically that we were dead in our sins. God, through Jesus, raised us from the dead. That was God's work, not ours, which means that we cannot boast about it. Uh, that's just a summary. So I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and then uh, get right into the text. So, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so real quick, um, there's an outline on the back. Hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, but I just want to explain the structure of Ephesians just a tiny bit. I think that will help us understand as we go through this passage. So Ephesians is six chapters uh, written by Paul, and it's really divided right down the middle. Um, so the first three chapters, you could say, are all about our position, all about our position, who we are in Christ. The next three chapters, four through six, are all about our practice. So position, practice, you could say it like that. Um, and it's all about how do we live now that we are Christians? How do we live in light of the fact that we've been saved? And Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, obviously, fits right smack dab in the middle of 1 through 3, which is all about our position. And we're going to see how our passage connects 1 and 3, but also points us to 4 and 6. 
So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, so on the back is an outline, like I said, and the title of this sermon is You Are God's Workmanship, So Don't Boast in Your Christian Walk. So I think that's the main thing that Paul was telling the Ephesians and therefore telling us. So we'll go through four points today. The first one is you are unable to save yourself from God's wrath. The second point is God saved you by raising you from the dead. The third point is you are God's workmanship or Christians are God's workmanship. And the fourth point is don't boast in your Christian walk. So first point, number one, you are unable to save yourself from God's wrath. And if we look at Ephesians 2, 1, we see the first reason that this is. Starts out, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We know that dead people don't do things. I don't even have to give you an analogy for that. We, we know that. We know that. Um, but, but Paul explains kind of what our deadness looks like here. So we're going to look at that first. Um, so if you look at verses 2, uh, sorry, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were following the course of this world. You were following the prince of the power of the air, refers to Satan. And you were living in the passions of your flesh. He expounds a little bit, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So this is who we all are without Jesus, or if you're saved, before Jesus. So let's just look at what he describes here real, first, real quick. And the first thing he says is, we're following the course of this world. And so the Bible's pretty clear. Um, ever since sin entered the world, the course of this world has not been a good one. In fact, it's headed for destruction. And if we look on an individual level, Matthew 7, 14 sums this up really well. So Matthew 7, 14 says this. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. So following the course of this world, what our spiritual deadness looked like is we were headed for destruction. Okay, that's the first thing Paul says. We were headed for destruction. Second thing he says, we were following Satan. We know that print, the prince of the power of the air is Satan, because in the Bible, other places... It calls Satan that. This is what Jesus, if you're saved, our Savior has to say about Satan. John 10.10, 10, the thief, referring to Satan, comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. So, so far, our spiritual deadness is you're headed for destruction, and you're following a being who wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. So far. Third, he says we're living in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And that one might not seem so bad, right? It feels good to gratify our desires. Uh, really, most of us, <laughs> before we knew Jesus, probably only lived to do that for the most part. It doesn't seem that bad. What's wrong with passions? What's wrong with passions? But the key word here is that we're living in the passions of the flesh. And if we look down at the end of verse 3 here, so 2, 3, Paul says this, and we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And so the Bible teaches we're all born sinful. And so because of our, our state, living in, the, living in the passions of our flesh or carrying out our desires actually leads to death. And we see this in James 1.15. It says, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin brings forth death. So just summary real quick of what we look like without Jesus in our spiritual death. We're headed for destruction. We're following a being who wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. And even as we live out the things that we want to do, we're headed towards death. But that's not even... Paul's main point here. So the main point, you are unable to save yourself from God's wrath. And I actually think I heard this analogy from Mark Bennett. So thank you, Mark. Um, but just what it looks like to be dead. And so I want you just to picture the ocean. Um, we've all seen an ocean, I, I hope. If not a large lake, you can do that too. Um, so, right, 
but it's not the Indian Ocean, it's not the Atlantic Ocean, it's not the Pacific Ocean. This ocean, uh, kind of depressingly, is named the ocean of your sins and trespasses. And I think sometimes it's easy for us, um, before we believed in Christ, but also looking back, to kind of think, okay, I'm in the ocean of my trespasses and sins. Okay, I know that. Uh, Paul says that you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay, I was in the ocean. I was kind of floundering around, right? I was almost drowning, barely keeping my head above water. Jesus came out in a boat, threw me a, a life raft, right? Threw me a uh, life preserver, and I grabbed on. And Jesus pulled me in. I kind of kicked a little, you know. He brought me into land, and, and I, that's how I was saved in, in this analogy, right? But the fact is, is that that's not what Paul says. So if you're in the ocean of your trespasses and sins, you're smack dab in the middle, you're not floundering, you're dead. And we might as well say you're chained to the bottom. That is the situation that Paul describes here when he says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And so we see here, it's pretty clear, you are unable to save yourself from God's wrath if that's your situation. That's a bad situation. <laughs> um, let's go to the, the second kind of thing that he, where he shows us that you are unable to save yourself from God's wrath. And that is in verse 3. Um, he says this, And you were by nature children of wrath. And so what I want to describe here is being a child of wrath means that you are destined for hell. Or another way to say it, hell was your destination. Hell was your destination. And so a child of wrath, just want to explain that a little bit. It's not someone who walks around all angry or a really like mean child, right? Or someone who walks around just kind of like, eh, you know, that's not what a child of wrath is, <laughs> as interesting as that would be. Um, but a child of wrath is the opposite of a child of God. And so child of wrath, child of God, in those statements, the of shows you what you get in the end, when everything ends. So the Bible teaches end of time, we will all stand before Jesus, whether we believe in him or not, right? Whether, whether we think he's real, whether we want to follow him or not, we will all stand before Jesus. And the of shows what you'll get. So if you're a child of wrath, you will get God's wrath in the end for your sin, of wrath. If you're a child of God, you will get God in the end, of God. So when, when Paul calls us before we knew Jesus or without Jesus, children of wrath, he's saying that we are destined for God's wrath without Jesus. The surety of that is something that really just hits home the position that we were in, right? He can say we we're children of wrath because that's where we were headed. And, and just real quick, you know, maybe it's easy to downplay that sometimes. You know, if you're a Christian, think about hell. I don't know. Sometimes it's easy to just be like, okay, I get it. If, you, if you're not trusting in Jesus, you're like, oh, I've seen hell in movies, whatever, right? But we've got to remember what the Bible says about hell. So just real quick, Revelation 20.10 calls it a lake of fire and brimstone. It says, the people who are there will be tormented day and night. These are really hard things to hear, right? Matthew 13, 42 says, it's a furnace of fire. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the situation that Paul lays out for us without Jesus. And so something for us to think about, if you're a Christian, do you really believe that your situation before Christ was this bad? Do you really believe that your situation before Christ was this bad? It's easy to forget. If you're a non-Christian, do you really believe that this is the situation you're in? But there's good news. We have the gospel, right? Verse 4, but God. Two most maybe important words in this passage, but God. You were dead destined for hell, but God. Let's look in verse four, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. In verse seven, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so this is our second point. God saved you 
by raising you from the dead. Or God can save you by raising you from the dead. And the first thing we see right here is God made you alive with Christ. We see that in verse five, okay? God came in because of the love that he has for us, even when we don't deserve it, because of his mercy. He has, if you're a Christian today, he has raised you from your spiritual deadness. And in verse five, he has made you alive together with Christ. And so real quick, if you can, let's turn over to John 11, 38 through 44. I was just flipping through looking for it, and then I realized I put a thing there. <laughs> Happens. Um, so this is, this is when Jesus laid, raised Lazarus from the dead. And this is just a great example because physical death is often more tangible to us, whereas spiritual death can kind of seem, I don't know, vague. This is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Then Jesus, verse 38 Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. So Lazarus was super dead, just like we were. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And so if you have trusted in Jesus, what Paul is telling us here is that God saved you by raising you from the dead. This is your story, spiritually. This is your story. You can put in your name. Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. I can put in my name. Seth, come out. He raised me from the dead. He made me alive with Christ. But not only that, because we said that we were dead spiritually, which means we're separated from God. Well, he's made me alive together with Christ. I'm with Christ now. But it's not only that. We're also destined for hell. And now God has destined you for heaven with him for eternal grace. And we see this in verses six and seven. Verse six and seven. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so (laughs) this is what God has done has reversed everything in your life if you've trusted in him. And, and you may be wondering, how can Paul talk to the Ephesians and talk about this so um, as if it's already happened, right? He says, and he has raised us up with him. And we know we're not sitting in heaven with Jesus right now. Wish we were, but we're not. How can he talk about it like that? And again, it's because it's something called the already not yet. And we can talk like that. Paul can talk like that because it's so certain that if you have trusted in Jesus, that you'll end up in heaven, it's like it's already done. It's like it's already done. And so just review real quick of what what we've learned so far, what this passage has told us is that before Jesus, without Jesus, you are dead. You are destined for hell. That is hard news. That is bad news. I don't like telling anybody that. But God, through Christ, when you trust in him through faith, raises you. You're no longer separated from Christ. You're now with Christ. Not only that, you are guaranteed to be with God forever in heaven and experience the immeasurable riches of his grace there through Christ. That is quite the turnaround that that God has done. And and so I just want to, you know, if you're here today and you don't know what you think about Jesus, as Pastor Scott says, or you've rejected Jesus, or you've said, I'll get to it later, or maybe you just still want to want to understand more. This is what God has done for you when you trust in him. When you have faith in him. And so that is there for you to take. You have to have a response. God didn't die. Jesus when Jesus died, he didn't save everybody. 
as in you don't just get saved by Jesus' death. You have to respond. And the respond that Jesus, response that God is looking for is repenting from your sin and having faith in Jesus. That's it. It's trusting that Jesus did this for you and turning away from the spiritually dead person you were. So if you want to know more about that, talk to an elder. Um, whoever brought you can point out an elder. Talk to the person who brought you, or you can talk to me as well. Um, all of us in this room who are believers now, we're spiritually dead. All of us. All of us were. And so God offers that. Point three, you are God's workmanship. And so Paul's laid out this, this really hard news, then this beautiful news that we can be saved from these things. But now he's going to tell us and show us why is he telling, telling the Ephesians this here. So point number three, you are God's workmanship. We see this in verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So first... Um, you are God's workmanship. I just want to just real quick, the definition of workmanship. I don't use that word anymore. I don't know if you guys do, but I don't. So it really just means to create something, to make or do something. And so if it's clearer, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, we could say we are his creation. We could say we are his handiwork. And the point here is that God is the one who does the work in our lives. God is the one who does the work in our lives. We are his workmanship. We are his creation. And so the first way we see we're God's workmanship is that we, uh, God is the one who does the work in our salvation. And the second way we see it in this passage is that God prepared beforehand all of your good works. So I'm going to try to explain that so it's, it's more clear. So God does the work in our salvation. This is really clear in verse 8. He's talking about grace. You have been saved through faith. He says, this is not your own doing. It's a gift from God. God is the one who works your salvation. He says after in verse 9, it's not a result of your works, but God's the one who did it. And so basically, what Paul's saying here is, God does the work in our salvation. There is nothing you can do by yourself. There's not enough good works. You cannot be nice enough. You cannot be a good enough person to go from wrath to grace. You cannot be a good enough person to go from being dead to alive. That's impossible. That's impossible. The only way is Jesus. That is one of the ways that we see that we are God's workmanship. But the second way is that God has prepared all our good works beforehand. And so you may say, okay, I understand that I can't get to God. I can't be risen from the dead I can't escape God's wrath and be put into heaven with him by my good works. But what are the place of good works then? What are the place of good works in the Christian life? That question begs to be asked. And we see it right here. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that tells us what the role of good works are in the Christian life. They're not the basis of salvation. They're not the reason you went from dead to alive. But they flow from that salvation. And we see that here. You've been created in Christ Jesus. What he's saying by that is you've been saved. You've been made a Christian through Jesus. Now, uh, four good works that you should walk in them. And so you can kind of sum it up like this. Good works don't save you. But they are something you are saved for. Good works don't save you, but they are something you are saved for. Again, we see that in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so, what are good works? What are good works? Because God has prepared good works beforehand for us. What are they? I think sometimes when I think of good works, um, I think probably some people are like me in this. They might think of something like feeding the homeless 
or volunteering in your free time, maybe giving money to charity, or maybe even just being nice and being a nice person. All of those things can be good works. But what, what the Bible really speaks of in terms of good works has more to do with obeying Jesus and obeying the Bible. So this is where the structure of Ephesians comes in. I think that from studying this, if I had to give one chunk of scripture from Ephesians to sum up the whole thing, it would be Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So it says, by grace you have been saved. It's not your own doing. And then it says, verse 10, we're created for good works, right? God has prepared beforehand our good works. And that's what Ephesians 4 through 6 are all about. So let me read you some of the good works that God has prepared for us. Humility, this is Ephesians 4, humility, gentleness, patience with other believers, loving other people, other Christians and other non-Christians, even when it's hard. That's a good work that God has prepared beforehand for you. Loving your spouse well. If you still live with your parents, obeying your parents. Fighting sin with the armor of God. Singing, as Scott likes to say a lot, both to each other and to God. That's a good work in Ephesians 4 through 6. Clinging to what is pure. So all these things are the good works that God has prepared beforehand for us. And that's not to say that feeding the homeless couldn't be a good work. It definitely could be. But disconnected from Jesus, disconnected from the Bible, in faith in him, that's not what, what the Bible is saying for good works. Um, it's not just a performance thing, right? We've kind of been seeing that. And so, again, just good works that God has prepared beforehand is obeying Jesus through obeying the Bible. And we see the connection between God's word and Jesus in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word there refers to Jesus. It tells us that later in the passage. So God prepared every good work for you beforehand. Beforehand. So what does this mean for us? And this is our final point for today. What does this mean for us? If God is the one who has done the work in our salvation and he's the one who's done the work, he's prepared beforehand the good works for us, what does this mean for us? So this is our fourth point. Don't boast in your Christian walk. This is what Paul says. He, he, he lays out where we were. We were dead. He shows us how we were alive. Right? He does all this to show us this is God's work, so don't boast. We see that in Ephesians 2 verse 9. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so this passage tells us God's good work in our salvation and God's good work in pre-planning our good works. So we shouldn't boast in the same way in our salvation or in our good works. And so I just want to ask some questions that will hopefully diagnose this in us about whether we do this, if, if we're saved. So the first question, do I boast in my salvation? One way to see this, do I believe that I can be good enough to get to heaven by doing enough good things? Do I believe that? If I believe that, according to the Bible, that is boasting. Because you're saying that I am good enough to pay for my sins. I am good enough to get to God. Maybe a lot of us aren't there. So let's keep going. Do you believe that you are a Christian because of anything in you? Do you believe that you are a Christian because of anything in you? Maybe you think, well, I'm more willing to listen or I have the right temperament, or I grew up in a Christian family, so it was bound to happen. But this is another version of boasting in your own salvation. There was nothing in you. You were dead. God didn't look at you and see anything that made him save you. Now, God loves you, right? God created you, but it was nothing in you that made him save you. And again, like this type of thinking, it was something in me. You can't be less dead or more dead. I think of the princess bride, you definitely, in the princess bride, you can be like mostly dead, right? But that's not, that's not reality. Um, another question, 
Maybe, maybe we're like, okay, I, I know this. I've heard this before. I know that I can't earn my own salvation. I know there was nothing in me that made God choose me. So let's ask some more, some more questions. Do we live as though we can gain God's favor through the good things we do? For example, when you sin, do you ever find that you feel the need to do something drastic to get back into God's good graces? This is a form of boasting in our salvation because God saved you through Jesus when you were dead spiritually <laughs> and you were only you were only doing things that were against Jesus. So I, I felt this one for sure. But that is a form of your salvation. God loved you when you were dead. He's going to love you now that you're alive. That is a form of boasting in our salvation. We shouldn't do that. Another question, do you ever think that God doesn't love you unless if you do enough? This could be serving in church. This could be reading your Bible. This could be whatever it is for you. Do you believe that God doesn't love you unless you do enough? And again, I'll say, don't boast in your salvation. You were dead. You were dead. And God loved you and he chose you and he saved you. Final one for do we boast in our salvation? Do you ever look down on people who don't believe in Jesus because they are just so sinful or you could say their lives are such a mess? That is not the way that God tells us to view people who don't trust in him. And in fact, it's boasting because again, we act as if we weren't the same. We act as if we weren't the same, but we were. We were exactly the same. We were dead. The last thing we're going to look at Don't boast in your salvation because God is the one who saved you. Don't boast in your good works because God has prepared all of them for you beforehand. Some more questions. Um, So it's funny doing this sermon. Uh, My sin comes out in me going back and forth between this is going to be terrible and I can't do it. I don't want to do it. And um, it's really scary. But like almost as soon as I think that, then I'm also like, I'm the man. Like, this is going so well. And like, everyone's going to love me, right? And like, people are going to think like, I have a future in this. And so, which is just great. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's terrible. Um, terrible what sin does to you. But um, it was really good doing this sermon. Because as I'm, as I'm taking the time to plan it out and realize, oh my gosh, like me doing this sermon is a good work that God's pre-planned before. So how am I going to boast? That's ridiculous, right? So that was so helpful for me. And so my question for you is, and oh, and I struggled with that all the way up till I walked up here. So it's not as if like I figured it out. Um, Do you think, do you sometimes think the same way I did that I was thinking? When you do something well spiritually, are you tempted to boast in yourself? That's a question for us. Maybe you say the right word to a friend who's struggling. Maybe you share the gospel with someone at work, someone you know. Could be a whole range of things. Do you boast in yourself for that? Because this passage would say that is ridiculous. Because God pre-planned that beforehand for you. He's the one who did it. Three more questions. Do you sometimes look down on other Christians because you serve more in church than them? That is boasting in your good works. God prepared those opportunities to serve beforehand. Do you sometimes feel inappropriate amounts of pressure to do something to serve God? It could be share the gospel, have a tough spiritual conversation. Do you ever feel inappropriate amounts of pressure? What I mean by inappropriate amounts of pressure is pressure that is putting the pressure on yourself to do these things for God instead of sitting living in the realization that anything God has for you, he's already pre-planned and he will give you the strength to do. That's a huge one for me. Final question. Do you look down on other believers when you are more spiritually mature, or at least you think you are, in a certain area than them? And again, this is boasting in your good works because you act as if your spiritual maturity is your own doing and not God's. But that's not true. God has grown you, and he's growing every one of us as a Christian. (laughs) So just in conclusion, then I'll pray. Um, 
we see here that we were dead, that God through Jesus made us alive. We see in verse 8 that the way that you can take, I don't want to say take advantage, but take advantage of what Jesus has done for you is through faith, through putting your trust in Jesus. Again, if you're not saved and if you're interested in knowing more, talk to someone about what that, what that looks like. All of that is God's work. So all of the work in the past from your salvation is God's work. But we see in verse 10, all of your work in the future, all the things that God has for you to do are his work as well. So don't boast. That, that's what we learn from this. Um, you are God's workmanship. So don't boast in your Christian walk. And I'll pray. <coughs> Dear God, I, I pray that we would live in this, that we would repent of the times we do boast, that we would be willing to repent over and over and over again as our sinful hearts just love to take the credit for ourselves. But I thank you for the beautiful, the beautiful picture that since we didn't save ourselves, it's not on us. We don't have to be good enough. We don't have to not sin to get to you. We don't have to be the ones to save ourselves because we can't. But you already sent Jesus. He already died on the cross. You are the one who has saved those who trust in you already. And you are the one who will save anyone else that is going to come to you. Humbly repent and have faith in you. We also thank you that all our good works, you don't save us and then tell us to do a bunch of stuff under our own power. But everything that we have in front of us, you have prepared beforehand. So Lord, just please help us to believe this today and through your Holy Spirit work in our hearts. And in Jesus' name, amen.